Sure. I'll, I'll actually, it's in the it's in the presentation. I can't help but talk about myself, so it's uh, it's in there. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So uh, sounds like I can get started. Um, when um, Ted asked me to do the talk, I um, had to reflect a little bit on how to structure this. We'll we'll wait for just a second. We'll close the door. Um, I'd I'd like to. I like to try to do interactive talks, so I might try to draw some people in, but I don't know how that's going to work with our online presence, but um, I'll try to, to extract questions from people. We'll see how that works, and then if it's a little rocky, we'll, we'll adjust. Okay. Great. All right. Okay, so... Um, um, so my name's Steve, um, and uh, a little bit about this talk and who it's targeted to. Um, I would like to target this talk to absolute beginners, so just barely getting your feet wet in Linux. Um, hardly any experience. Um, and I'll come back to this, this other point about does anyone want to volunteer where they're at. Um, I'm assuming that as a beginner in Linux that you're interested in the desktop. So you're thinking about, I want to go to Linux, but I want to have win, you know, windowed things. I want to have a, a file manager where I can explore around, and um, I want to be able to browse the web, that type of thing. Uh, this talk is not a tutorial. We're going to talk about the, um, the things you encounter as you're going through this process. Uh, there are plenty of great tutorials on YouTube. Um, I said I would link to someone at the end, but uh, this is the first time I'm giving this talk, so uh, that did not happen. So, um, but the goal, you know, kind of uh, when, we, when we're stuck in the workplace for a long time, we're trained to think about the why of everything, and uh, I struggled a little bit on that initially. But, but what I really want to do is to help anyone sort of over these hurdles and to get into Linux because um, I think it's been very good for me and I'd like for other people to have that opportunity too and to not get stuck where I got stuck. Uh, I'd like to reduce your pain a little bit and um, uh, actually give you perspective or, or help you understand the landscape of the, the journey that you're in, potentially. My, my journey is much older at this point. so. The landscape has shifted underneath of me. Um, so uh, let's let's try to get some interaction right now. Do we have any sort of uh, people who are truly new to Linux or who are just getting started who'd like to just say, hey, this is where I'm at? I'll give it about 15 if I, seconds. If I'm new as someone I think in my um, my preconceived notion of, of who this is targeted to, it's someone who's been in Windows primarily, and then is sort of dabbling in Linux, and is but but can't quite get there. Do you want me to try to expand that at all? 
Peter. Okay, I can't go that far. I can go that far. And then I might be able to... The problem is I can't figure out how to advance the slides from this spot. But I, I tried to... <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not in presentation mode. Yeah. Aye, aye, aye. All right, so, um, so any uh, comments from online or anybody in here want to offer up where they're at? Could, I could target Just things a little like bit. So now I'm, I'm a little bit ADHD, so I, I want to dig into that. But let's let, uh, let me wait another 15 seconds or so and see if anybody else wants to jump in with where they're at in the journey. So, so Peter, um, you said you transitioned, you went from, from Windows to Linux. That was, you went from Windows to Linux, right? I basically got rid of my last Windows partition. I transitioned okay. in, you know, about, probably a little bit before, but about that time I started using it okay. um, So I finally killed my work related, or mandated Windows box about 2005. Um, you know, just sort of. One more time, okay. We'll try this. Presentation will definitely work online. Yep. How's that? Oh, wow, that is a lot better. Is that okay for everybody in the room? Holy moly. Okay, great. Okay, so... Um, I, I will get to that. I actually went from Windows to Linux to Mac, and now I'm back on Linux. Uh, so yes, I can. Yes. Um, so that, but Peter brings up a good point in that um, even when I did this migration, it was uh, it started like in 09 ish. I'll get to to the timeline. Um, that situation was much different than it is today, it feels like to me. So um, as we can get comments from people who are sort of in the middle of it, there's a lot of information there that we kind of need, because we don't know. We're, we've already migrated, so we don't know what you're struggling with. Would be interesting to know. So we'll move on. Uh, let's see, so who am I? Um, and now I'll get back to the introduction a little bit. Uh, I've been in technical roles for 25 years-ish. Um, um, you know, mostly development. So I, I, I'm a software engineer or, or came out of school with a computer science degree and, and Java development and that type of stuff. And then, but that has kind of, but I'm a bit of a generalist and so it's, it's a little bit of everything. It's not just straight development. It, it, it's bridged into DevOps and uh, shifting some legacy platforms to cloud. Uh, and then I got pulled into management for a while. Um, probably not a great fit in management. Now I'm drifting back technical. So like the, it's, it's a diverse set of things that I'm doing uh, with Linux. And then just to give you just a, a snapshot of sort of the OA, uh, operating system progression that I've been through. Um, 
started out when I was early teens, a Commodore 64, and then my first job involved like a, uh, I think it was an IBM. It was the successor to the IBM, what was it, Junior? PC Junior was the next iteration. So, and we had spreadsheets and stuff, and then I was stuck in DOS land for a while. What's that? PS2, yes. Um, IBM PS2, I worked uh, in an accounting office and somehow or other we were running spreadsheets. And, uh, and I never touched OS2 yet. Now that you mentioned it, I might. Um, I, you know, so Win 3.11, you know, this is probably a standard progression for a lot of people. And uh, I will say I spent most of my time in XP Pro and uh, a few years in Win 7 before things sort of broke loose and I got to the good stuff. Um, and then, you know, like, how much of this do I actually use when I say that, you know, right now Linux is my daily driver. I don't use Windows unless the kids coerce me into gaming. And then I'll do whatever I need to do to get to their game. Um, but I'll boot that off of a different drive and it's like once a month. So effectively, like, I don't touch Windows at all. Um, and then, um, how much do I use it? Like, when I say it's my daily driver, I mean it's my daily driver and I drive for a living. Uh, so it's not like, oh, I spend, you know, an hour on my computer and it's my daily driver. It's all day, every day. Um, I don't, uh, yeah, so, so it's, my, it's, it's my job. Um, and I do my job while using a Linux desktop. Um, okay. So a rough outline of the talk is a little bit of the history of the migration, kind of when it happened for me, um, why. I, like I often look back and wonder why did I, why did I bother? What was, like how did I know that I wanted to do this? And it, it's hard, it's hard to figure out why. Because um, I don't remember, like there's a lot of stuff I've forgotten. Uh, then I'm gonna talk about the struggles like some of the obstacles you might run into and the, the things that my work around, some things that helped me. I'm gonna ask people here, like, what helped you? What kind of workarounds do you see? Um, and then I'm gonna try to, to characterize how I benefited from making the switch, uh, make a few recommendations about um, sort of general principles for getting through some of this. And then we'll see what kind of thoughts people have. All right, so we'll get into some history. Um, this probably dates me a little bit. Uh, generally, the interesting part of this whole chart is, starts around 2009, so we'll see if the camera will track. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's, raise the, right here. So we did get a blue, hold on. So we're experimenting with some new technology here. All right, I got, yep, you're good. Okay. All right. So we'll see, okay. Okay, good. So, um, so the interesting part, like I spent forever in Windows XP, like I was just solving problems and I didn't care. Uh, like operating systems didn't matter to me, I was solving problems. And then around 09, I had this general dissatisfaction faction with the state of things like Microsoft was really starting to annoy me and so I like this period from this is the hot spot 09 to roughly 2015 was uh, when this all uh, happened I had to research this I had to look through my emails because this was all lost history to me I don't remember this um, I remember pieces of it so uh, so it was this period of time when the, th the whole thing sort of came into focus and I thought, okay, it's time. Um, and then I'll come back to this slide. But there was a specific email. By the way, there, there is no place called Egbert. I'm sure that it's newegg.com. So, but what happened was hardware actually triggered this thing to happen. Hardware triggered my migration because um, I was, uh, I had my favorite laptop, I'd been on it way too long, the thing crashed, 
And I had my nephew try to uh, recover all of my data and, and get me started again. We were trying to reinstall Windows on this, this uh, laptop. And um, it wasn't working. Uh, and I could barely get Windows 7 to work. So at the, at the time, I had switched my main uh, workload over to a standby laptop, um, something my wife gave up. And I, I, was, I was OK. I was working fine. My job was getting done. I wasn't going to get fired. And uh, so then I was trying to get my old laptop back in the game. So uh, Windows 7 was giving me some issues, I think. And then um, I think at this point, my, I think my nephew said, hey, try Ubuntu. Am I pronouncing that right? I say Ubuntu. Same? OK. Um, so my nephew said, try Ubuntu. And of course, I ignored him. I went straight for. Uh, Linux Mint Cinnamon, I think. Does, does anyone know, it, like, is that, is that GNOME? Is that a GNOME desktop on Mint Cinnamon? OK. So, so there it was. Uh, so that's kind of when things got started, was 09. And I was triggered partly by hardware. And, and then there was this weird transition that took place where um, I started with hardware. I started and I put. Linux Mint on that laptop, and I struggled because, OK, there's, when you're installing on hardware, at least back then, there's driver problems. OK, so probably the first thing that happens, I think, or at least happened to me was, wow, this is cool. This thing is working, but it's isolated. I don't know how to get anything to it. I can't browse the web. I had driver issues, so Wi-Fi wasn't working for me. Um, so right away, you're struggling. And uh, which isn't bad. I like to solve problems, so you know it was fun. Um, but after a while, and, and uh, after a while, it was sort of like, okay, I know I can't use this as my job computer um, because I have too much to learn. So um, another email from my nephew. He mentioned VirtualBox. I was familiar with VMware. Um, but he mentioned VirtualBox was completely new to me at the time. I didn't realize it existed, and uh, it was also free. So I'll talk a little bit about how I got away from using hardware, and I think that facilitated actually successfully uh, migrating completely to Linux. So um, it occurs to me that some of this stuff may be foreign kind of to the the audience about like, OK, virtualization, virtual box, um, running virtual machines inside of other machines. Uh, do we have any sort of indication? Are those terms that we need to explain? OK. So. Um, my initial, initial rig was an older laptop running Linux. And I'm doing various, you know, I'm having some, some problems. But I'm OK because I'm working on a different machine. Then uh, about this same time, I bought new hardware. Um, and that's one of, the, one of the things I'll come back to is I think another thing that facilitated I owned my own hardware, not controlled by corporate IT. So I had some freedom and flexibility. And that turned out to be important. So, um, so I bought a new hardware and put together a bunch of stuff. Um, and it was an early Intel i7 series chip. So it was like Intel i7, 980, whatever. And um, <clears throat> so. But I put Windows 7 on that because, all right, I liked Windows 7 a lot. And, uh, but I was really intrigued by Linux. And I put uh, VirtualBox on there so that I could run a virtual machine. And I dropped, um, I think at this point, I had somehow run into the KDE desktop. And um, I installed Kubernetes. And I, that was a mix that I stayed on for a long time. So, um, so 
So there's various iterations that happen as, as I go through this. So it's hardware, and then it's uh, Windows 07 as a wrapper around uh, the Linux virtual machine. Um, I did this for a long time, and, I, and what I did is I started to shift the workload into the VM because there were things dragging me over there. And then eventually I flip-flopped. I blew away Windows and I installed Linux as the host operating system. Now I had Linux on the hardware again, but I'd already crossed sort of a lot of the learning uh, that needed to happen in order to take that risk. And, um, and then I ran Windows 7 in a VM for a while, and this gradually shrunk. Uh, and then there's, there's other stuff later where I'm distracted by Macintosh for a while. Okay. Um, but anyway, so um, I still don't fully understand why I was uh, gravitated towards Linux. Um, I have some things listed here. I can talk about those. Uh, I'm curious, you know, for people that are interested now or making this migration now, if anybody wants to pipe up and tell us. What's attracting you to Linux? Um, it was, it's, peer pressure is a little bit of a joke here, um, it, but it was partly, it was partly that. There was like pressure in the marketplace where I was bumping into Linux concept. Um, but also I did have people who were like, you should try Mac, you should try um, Linux, but they were partly just joking. Um, Actually, the, uh, you know, one of the things, it's all the way down here on number four, was like some of these bash tools. I kept running into uh, to, uh, things like, I would see people using um, the tail command, tail-f. So that lets you look at a log and see it streaming. This concept of this log streaming just blew me away. And um, at the time, like a lot of our production systems were all cloud, uh, not cloud, on-premise. And so the customers were running Windows. And so, but I wanted, I needed to be able to see that log tail. And um, so, you know, I looked around, I found things like, uh, I think at the time, bear tail or something that you could run in, in Windows and do a similar type of thing. Um, but I always wanted that, I wanted tail dash F, I wanted that in the terminal. Starting to see the value like of splicing these tools together. Um, and I, was st I started using, if, if you're familiar with like SigWin, I spent a fair bit of time in SigWin, um, just so I could have these bash tools, these terminal tools. Um, Right, now can you repeat that last part? Cost benefits, right, and, and the security thing. Now I don't have security listed, but that's a big one. Um, cloud, actually it's wrapped up into cloud for me. Um, source control, Git, I won't talk a ton about that. Uh, we don't have time, but... Um, uh, the Git, in order to use Git back then, uh, you kind of needed to know some things about Linux. Like, making things work on Windows was hard or different, or like you wouldn't find the tutorials for how to make this work on Windows because actually all the people that wanted to talk about it were Linux-based. Almost with every new technology I was stumbling into, I, uh, I was finding that the, the people that wanted to talk about it were Linux uh, users. So good to go? Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna switch to struggles. Um, how am I doing on time, by the way? Did I? Okay. All right, I I know people tune out long before. I'll try to keep the pace moving. Right. Okay. Um, so I've already talked about, but when we talk about Linux, like I forgot about the struggles. Uh, initially, I, I was like. Oh, the transition was easy. Like when I thought about doing this talk, I was like, oh, the transition was easy. It was not easy. Like there are struggles uh, and you have to be very careful with how you uh, manage your risk as you're learning the thing. If you're making a transition of your workflow from Windows to Linux, there are risk spots in that transition. So you have to manage. You don't want to put yourself in a position where in order to do your job tomorrow, you have to stay up all night solving a network driver issue. You do not want to be there. That's torture. Um, and so I only played the hardware risk game for a little while. And that was sort of, it was never in my workflow. Um, I waited until I had really sort of mastered uh, most of the Linux concept. No, that's, master is the wrong word. I tend to learn things just enough to keep moving. Mastery isn't quite there. Um, but, but I had trouble with everything, like video drivers, um, network drivers. It was not, often, I would get a Linux machine up, and then it's like, oh, I got to plug in a USB dongle in order to get network um, to work. Um, a lot of times, I would upgrade, and Grub would get confused about where to start. Uh, and I'm not a Grub expert. A lot of times, I would just reinstall that machine something else. Um, sometimes maybe the desktop would flake out. I could get up to a terminal login, but the desktop would be like, oh, I don't feel like coming up. Um, that definitely happened. Sound not as important to me, um, so I didn't, it probably happened, but it wasn't hang up. Um, and then printing, which I never do. Um, I've heard other people say that printing is a problem, or was a problem. And, um, but that's another one that I didn't stumble with because I don't tend to print things. If I do, I'm like printing to PDF and then I'm archiving that somewhere, sending it over. Uh, does anybody want to chime in? Like maybe some struggles that uh, the audience is having. Um, give you a few minutes to pipe up if you're willing. That last one. Okay. Um, so, I never had that backup um, problem. Hmm, I'll have to think about that. But, but actually, what Zoe's saying here is, is, how can I recover if one of these terrible things happens? Like, how can I get back to normal? And the way that I did it, um, wasn't by planning, it was I stumbled into the virtual box, virtual machine thing, and uh, like I had on the, the previous slide, I had Windows 7 running in the host OS, which was very stable. I could always get to my host OS. But then I would switch right into my virtual box VM and I did all of my workload in the VM. Now, virtual box, so I'm gonna say virtual box a lot. If you're learning Linux, uh, virtualization, I think, I mean, anybody, uh, Feel free to, to disagree, but virtualization is a friend um, because you can, um, in VirtualBox, like learn snapshotting first thing. 
learn to do a snapshot because you can, you can start your Linux up, work around it, then you can start taking risks. Uh, if you say, well, I went through all of that work to install that clean version of, of Ubuntu with you know KDE, everything's arranged the way I want, then you can go into VirtualBox and say, okay, that system is the way I want it at this point in time. Let me take a snapshot, let me name it uh, the way I name mine is like Ubuntu clean or something like that. And um, all right, now I'm about to take a risk. So I'm like two weeks later from that, I still have that snapshot laying around, but the machine is sort of migrated because I'm working in it. And then uh, two weeks later, I'm like, I want to try installing this new video driver or who knows what. Um, and I'll, before I do that risky thing, I'll take a snapshot in the VirtualBox uh, manager and it's typically for me, it's named such and such before doing this risky thing. Um, and then I'll try it out for a while and then if I feel like I've sort of degraded that particular um, virtual machine so that it doesn't work for me anymore, then I can roll back to just prior and, and go. Other uh, questions or comments? I, no, I, go ahead. I'm not surprised. Surprised that uh, some of our people. Um, so of all of those, was it? I still think the backup thing, and also the R sync. I'm curious about the R sync. Like, why? What kind of trouble? Any. Time machine. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, R-Sync, uh, one of those, I talk about the bash tools that sort of dragged me into Linux, value that I was seeing. For, there were these things as I got, as I started to, to get my foot in the water, like tools came out of nowhere, and you know, they've been around forever, but they don't exist for, a, for Windows users, or they do their sort of commercial offering. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about, about how being in Linux changes um, the way that you select tools, sort of your ability to be agile. Um, <clears throat> okay, so there are hardware obstacles. Um, and then there's software up. And I, after thinking about this whole thing for a couple of weeks, I started to remember how I struggled. Because I was, um, the main thing is like, if you work in a company, like at the time we had about 50 people. Um, and Microsoft Exchange Server was a thing. And, um, It's, it's like everyone used Outlook, and we weren't super dependent on the calendar in Outlook, but, but Outlook was important. 
Uh, and so you couldn't, you could sort of tinker around with which mail client you used, um, but a lot of times you don't have quite a lot of freedom. At the time I worked around this, um, I asked the IT guy to forward all of my email to G never fly with corporate IT. Um, but that's what I did, and then I, I used Gmail as my uh, mail client for a long time, and, and it worked. Testing, mic check. Mic check. Testing, one, two, three. Uh, so, so email, Microsoft Outlook as a mail client was absolutely a problem. And, and I think it, um, things are probably a little different today, but for me, big, it was a big deal. I had to, it took me a while to get out of that. And then, um, uh, this is the big one, is like, it's the Microsoft problem in general, Back then, uh, Microsoft Office was just it. You go to work for a company and there's like five people. They're definitely using Microsoft Office and they're definitely using Microsoft Excel. That was the landscape back then. And, um, you know, as a developer, I didn't have to deal with that quite as much as if I may be closer to some of the business side of the organization. As a developer, I mostly just needed to read documents. I didn't have to create the perfect Word document. Um, and sometimes I was updating an Excel spreadsheet, but not often. All right, so I cheated because there, back then there were some open um, offerings. So I can't remember. I think Sun was the one that uh, uh, was behind OpenOffice. And so OpenOffice had a spreadsheet and it had uh, uh, like a word processor, and then some other stuff like presentation, I think. Anyway, uh, Oracle bought Sun, and the people behind this effort, I think, got scared, and they branched, probably smartly so, forked, and they forked to LibreOffice, and that's still around. And whenever I install a Linux desktop, and I think, oh, I'm going to need to view Excel spreadsheets on this desktop, um, I will go ahead and install LibreOffice today. Uh, it's um, however, the whole landscape has changed because, like, if your company has Microsoft Office 365 subscription, um, a lot of this doesn't matter to you because you pull up a browser, you log in, and you have online offerings. You've got, like, Word, um, PowerPoint, Excel, uh, the whole, you know, like, everything's on, and, and people, well, so you can do everything in the browser. Do a lot in the browser. Not as good as having a Microsoft Outlook client, let's say, but I currently do all of my stuff through Office 365 in the browser, and I do not install any of the native clients. Even if they offered them for Linux, I'm just not going to install Microsoft anything on my uh, Linux system. It uh, feels wrong. So um, the other thing about that, and this is one of the uh, hurdles. Well, no, it's not. It's a benefit. Uh, but, but the other thing that I've forgotten about this was how much the Microsoft Office suite dragged down a typical piece of hardware. Like back in 2009, uh, you, you would have a machine. You would, you would get uh, your Windows operating system installed. And then next thing you know, you're, you're saying, all right, I need email. Install that, and you install Microsoft Office. And next thing you know, this machine that actually felt really responsive is now um, just like a potato, uh, just awful. And so one of the things that drove me into Linux was partly was just getting away from this sort of Microsoft-centric um, stuff. 
Okay, another point about VirtualBox. Um, I mentioned the hardware problems. So a lot of times new users are trying to salvage like old hardware and they pull up an old laptop and they can get, they can get Linux installed on it and then they're struggling with some hardware issues, driver issues, things like that. Um, here's the thing about VirtualBox is all of that hardware is virtualized. The hardware that's ex presented to your Linux virtual machine virtualized do these things that um, are very well supported by most distributors. So like this is, this is another advantage of using VirtualBox is you wind up never fighting drivers because the same driver then it, you know, most distributions will bake up their stuff so that VirtualBox runs well. So uh, it's a very good tool. I'll keep bringing it up. Uh, a couple of pointers for VirtualBox uh, that I ran into is if you're new and you're just trying to get things running and you just want to connect to the web from the VirtualBox uh, Linux virtual machine, um, there's a networking mode that, that's on by default. It starts up and it's called NAT. I think it stands for Network Address Translation, but I'm not an expert. Um, that uh, that works. That lets that box communicate with the outside world so that if your host can see the internet, your, your, your little virtual machine can also see the internet and you can use the browser. Good to go. Uh, once you start crossing into sort of maybe some intermediate territory, but I want to talk to my virtual machine from, uh, from, my, from, from my Windows host. Um, so you'll, you'll want to, I don't know, what are some things that might, like maybe you're running a MySQL instance or like a, a database instance down in the virtual machine and you want to use a client tool sitting in your host's uh, Windows system. Um, I believe in order to do that, you cannot use NAT. And so I struggled with this for a while and then I don't know what happened. I think, I honestly think VirtualBox improved their bridged network at some point. And all of a sudden, if I just switched to bridged right away, all of a sudden I could do all the stuff I wanted to do. I could talk from virtual machine A to virtual machine B. Uh, both of those systems could reach the outside world and the host could see both of those systems. So um, bridged networking might be something to pay attention to uh, as you get more comfortable with VirtualBox. Uh, and then there's this other thing in VirtualBox that's kind of annoying is uh, installing the guest editions, which is still murky to me because I don't quite understand where some of the virtualization technology that's baked into Linux and where that ends and where guest editions, VirtualBox guest edition uh, begins. So um, I would, I, my guess is like right now, if you're starting today, you should and you install a Linux operating system in the virtual machine, my guess is that you need to install the uh, VirtualBox guest edition. So the way that works is after you get your virtual machine set up, um, you will need to mount or like, in, it's basically like virtually inserting a CD into that virtual machine. And then you need to run the um, guest edition. What that does for you is it makes your desktop in the virtual machine um, work nicely with your host operating system. So you'll be able to copy from the VM over to, um, like you can select text in the VM, copy it, you'll copy it to the clipboard, then you can paste it in your host and vice versa. Um, and there's other nice features where if you resize your uh, virtual machine window, um, the resolution of the virtual machine underneath of that will change magically, kind of say, hey, I want to see more with my virtual machine. How are we doing on time? Uh, okay, so I tend to ramble.
try to watch them. Okay, so uh, some helpful things along the way, like some of these things I wish I had kind of spent more time. <clears throat> um, VirtualBox as a learning tool uh, was invaluable to me, and then especially snapshots. So for new people coming out of Windows, um, I would highly recommend figure out VirtualBox, start to learn about it, um, figure out snapshots, and figure out your networking. There, there is, there are some things that is still annoying. Like that's seems like it would be a perfect world, uh, but I can tell you sometimes I fight with the clipboard. Um, sometimes it, that that clipboard synchronization is still a little bit of an issue. Um, one thing I would do differently now, I would put more energy into finding a uh, Linux community. Um, I remember back then wishing that I had a Linux that could get me over a lot of these hurdles. Point me in the right direction. Tell me what I need to learn so that I'm not Googling, pasting a problem in, and then randomly following instructions. Very unsatisfying way to attack problems. It will work sometimes, but it's not satisfying because I didn't, I didn't learn anything. I wasted a lot of energy and didn't learn anything. Um, so put some energy into finding um, people that, that are sort of accessible, uh, who are willing to help, and don't ignore that. I did. I was very narrow mind, or focused, sort of a uh, little bit introverted. So uh, find, find communities, find people. Um, you know, a lot of times people are really willing to help, like to help. Uh, here's something that I think is completely different today than was 2009. The amount of tutorials on YouTube is incredible. Content is incredible. It's awesome. So I can go into YouTube and I can Google um, beginning, and there's going to be like 10 options. I can sample them until I find the speaker that kind of speaks at my level. And so YouTube as a training tool for people wanting to get into Linux, I think really good. Right. Oh, okay. And and what's your what's your name again? Alex. Let me know. <clears throat> okay. 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 
All right, so. So, uh, so internally here in the room, uh, we've had some discussion about YouTube and some good points about there's actually a lot of bad content that's not helpful and lead you in the wrong direction. I've, I've found that too. What I, what I tend to do is sample many sources and come back to the one that seemed most likely pan out. So, and a lot of times I'm doing this on 2x speed, and I'll listen, I'll listen 10 minutes into a talk, so maybe I spent, what, 2x, five, or so five minutes. I spent five minutes. A lot of times I don't last 30 seconds, maybe because the person just doesn't work for me. Um, and if I do that for 10 or 15 people, Eventually, I land on good sources, um, and then it it has helped me a ton. So it it's but a word of caution from the audience. Uh, YouTube is not necessarily the uh, best resource. Um, there's a lot of good blogs and websites, and uh, I, I need to sort of try to create a few of those sort of lists, but I feel like the uh, Fred Lug uh, website or community has already probably done that better than I can, so what you should do is um, really like a community like this is super good for, hey, where can I go to learn about something? And there's a lot of good presentations and slides um, that, that are Fred Lug already, so I didn't feel like uh, hating that. Um, Right. Any anybody else who's going through this process have any recommendations about here some things that might help you some of the struggles? Peter? Okay, well, that's the first time I've heard of Odyssey, so new to me. Oh, that's great. I definitely uh, learned something. 
So where are we at? Helpful things. Um, I think community, community and people can pay off tenfold. Um, if, if you put a little energy into that and find those people that can, are willing to help, that's invaluable. I remember, I remember just thinking like 10 years ago, who can I possibly talk to about Linux? Of course, there were all these meetups out there, like the Linux user groups have been around forever. But whatever, wherever I was located at the time, it was a long drive. Um, and so I didn't go, I was too late. And I paid for it, I should have went. Um, so before I go into this next slide a little bit, I, I wanna talk about the obstacles again because as I was preparing this, I'm a firm believer in do something poorly, uh, terribly, and then learn from it and perfect it. So this is the first time I've, I've done this talk and uh, it occurred to me that there's, there's like three classes of uh, problems or struggles for someone coming from Windows into Linux. The first one is conceptual. It's like, it's like, can you grasp the concepts of the Linux paradigm? You have to give yourself time to do that, but you also have to put energy into it. So there are, th there are conceptual things that are different that a lot of us have forgotten about. And I, I'm starting to remember them. Uh, so conceptually, there's a thing of, of variety. So um, there are different families of Linux, I guess we would call them. Um, and uh, some typical ones you'll hear are uh, Debian, um, I think Arch family or broad classification of um, and then the the red hat um, so there's at least three and probably a lot more but the three ones that you hear about a lot are arch debian and red hat and what you get like one thing that would give you really good perspective is if you google linux distribution tree and you'll see this something i should have included here you'll see this uh giant tree of distributions, sort of where each distribution comes from. And you know, you'd be like, oh, there's Ubuntu. And guess what? It came from the Debian family. And then you have all these other distributions that are based off of Ubuntu. Um, and then in some of the other uh, ones that I don't know as much about, I'm most, most familiar with Debian. But, um, Red Hat, I believe, is, is also, um, oh, what is it, Fedora? is part of that family. Yep. Hmm. <laughs> um So, but, so we've had some good examples from the, the Red Hat uh, tree of Linux. Uh, one thing in common of, of, about all of these distributions, I believe, I'm, a, I'm no expert here, but they all use the same kernel. So they all, so this, this thing, this Linux kernel that, that Linus Torvalds uh, developed, started back, what, early 90s? Um, that, 92. So that, that thing is at the heart of all of these distributions. Now, different versions of it, but, and I think it, each family may tweak the Linux kernel uh, for their own purposes. I'm not 100% sure about that, but in general, the, uh, the heart of all of these distributions is common, is the kernel, and I think we're up to, you know, it's been through different versions, and every year we're always looking kernel, great things out in it, uh, and I, we're up to like five something, version five-ish, um, so there's the, 
the Linux community is based around that kernel, that, that piece of code that is a kernel, and there's a whole bunch of developers that work on that. And then that's not, that's not something any Windows user understands, or, or does, it's not part of, like we just know Microsoft. Um, and we know, oh, the next version's coming, or um, here's a, a major update. Um, so, and then we, we also don't completely understand the amount of variety, or we don't understand what a distro is right off the bat. So we don't, like somebody says, well, you want to install Ubuntu, you want to install Linux Mint, or you want to install Red Hat. We don't actually understand what that means so we're in the Linux landscape for a while. Um, so it's, it's these uh, conceptual problems sort of keep us foggy. Um, there's, another, there's another thing that I struggled with was, what is a desktop? So I, I did understand that there was a way to install Linux that didn't have a desktop. And then I started to understand that, oh, here's some Linux stuff that has a desktop. But it was weird to me. Like I, I didn't, I didn't get it uh, for a long time. And so conceptually, you should put some energy into like conceptually understanding some of the, the abstractions. Um, like, and and I think one way to do this is to listen to people who talk about the history of. Uh, Unix, Linux, FreeBSD, um, or different pieces of the technology. For instance, for me, with desktops, I didn't quite understand what was going on until I heard a talk about uh, X Windows or X11 protocol. Um, so once I heard how that protocol was developed, I began to understand how the display paradigm in Linux sort of separate from the base package. So one of my recommendations is um, in order to, to grasp conceptually what's happening, um, try, try some history, because now the history is available. When I was, I feel like when, when I was going through this, the history was a little bit difficult to find, whereas now it's very much in your face. Go out and get it. Um, so, okay, so conceptual problems, and then hardware slash driver problems, and then software problems. And now I'll move on. So, a couple things I wish I had learned earlier. Um, I think SSH would have helped me a lot if I had. Learned um, so, is, is everyone familiar with SSH? How about in uh, uh, Good. Is there anything that they wish they had learned earlier? We probably have some people who are in the middle of you. I'm sorry, Zoe said no about SSH? Okay, so uh, so this is for beginners. So we'll talk to speak to the beginners. Um, so one of the problems I got into a lot was um, I've just installed a Linux thing over here, and I have a Linux thing here. Maybe I have a Windows thing with a Linux VM over here, and so but I got these machines and. Like, how do you share stuff? What do you do? So let's say they all have desktops. So I got three Linux machines and they all have desktops. You know, how do you share stuff? And, well, okay, so you can set up, what is that file sharing thing that, that we all use? Uh, I don't. Samba. Samba. Okay, so so you can you can tinker with Samba um, and set that up. Try to get like file sharing working. So that's one way to share things in these Linux 
Um, another one is, um, what is it? V what, what's the remote desktop app? Kind of native. VNC? Okay, what, what's new? Okay, so uh, uh, Peter was just saying, well, there's, if you want to share, and, and I asked about desktops, like, and I've got these three machines running Linux, uh, if one way you can share is with VNC, so you can say, all right, this machine's a VNC server, and then over here, I'm going to connect and see the desktop of this, this other Linux machine. And then, um, but there are newer, newer, there's a lot of ways to do that. So one is you can do it uh, sort of natively, X window, X protocol. Uh, there's a story about that. Uh, uh, one of the tricks we used to do in college was uh, we would magically make X windows appear on someone's terminal and their, what back then would probably be. But, um, so there's, there's X windows, and then uh, the current version of this, I think, is called Spice, uh, is what Peter's saying. And then, um, <clears throat> so, so, but you can share the screen. And so, all right, well, okay, I'm sharing the screen. But that is not really, for me, that was never a satisfactory solution. Even if I could share files and share the screens, that's really not what I was looking for. Um, a lot of times, I just wanted to connect into that machine, do something. Um, and I didn't learn how to do this until fairly, uh, fairly far in. And so there's this way to connect securely on a terminal. And you do that with SSH. It's not that difficult to set up. You, have, you do have to go to uh, the system that is sort of the target, and you have to say, I'd like to enable that. Um, and from your, from your other system where you're or sort of trying to connect to the target, uh, you are, I think it's, it's basically there by default, but you do have to set up like an SSH key. So this concept of um, SSH like pairs, RSA key pairs, things like that, not that difficult to get going, uh, and it's worth spending a little bit of time getting there. And then once you do that, you can sort of, that's sort of like your safety net of, I want to connect these systems, but I don't want to spend all this time connecting to VNC device or whatever. I'll just I'll, uh, terminal into that machine. And then you have a terminal um, right there, and you can execute commands. You can list directory. Um, not necessarily a GUI. Thing to okay. So, so Peter's saying. Hey, if you have SSH going, um, I, I said not really graphical. Peter's saying actually it is graphical because you can forward uh, that display to your local system. Uh, how hard would you say that is? So very quick, not anything that's going to take anybody a ton of time. Uh, probably worth even for myself. I'm Thank you. 
Okay. Stop what again? I'm not hurt. Oh, oh, okay, I got you. Right. That's the first time I've heard sneaker net. I've definitely. Uh, Alex was pointing out, in, in case you didn't hear him, uh, Alex was pointing out that um, there is a encryption key generation process you have to go through on your client machine um, to identify yourself and then encrypt the, uh, the connection between uh, you and the Okay, uh, right, so by default, I can just turn on OpenSSH on the server and, yeah. Okay, so there is a way to avoid uh, creating the encryption key. Uh, I would say that it's so easy to create the encrypted version, you could always do it. Uh, but there is a way to, that by default, you can do it your user exists on the target machine, uh, it sounds like you're good to go because you can just type in your password. There'll be a challenge response. They ask you for the password. Okay. Okay. So very low security if you're getting the password prompt. Uh, happy to say I don't. Um, see, so Conceptually, package managers are a thing that Windows users don't understand, um, or I didn't understand. Um, maybe not so much today, like maybe coming out of Windows today, I would, yeah, I, I understand. That. But uh, back then, pseudo apt what? I forget what the Red Hat variant um, package manager. RPM. Right. DNF now, yum, past. And then uh, Arch is, anybody know Arch? But Arch has its own variant. They, they all seem to have very equivalent uh, sort of usage syntax. So, but, but the concept of the package manager, I didn't quite understand it. Like, what, the way that I would sort of learn wasn't optimal. Um, I would need to do a thing. I would Google. I would find somebody on Stack Overflow who was doing a thing. A lot of times they would be like, oh, you just, you know, sudo apt install and certain things. And eventually I would get to where I needed to go. Um, but it's probably worth, like, understanding what package managers are at a base. And I wish I could go back and say, okay, Steve, just just wiki that or something. Stop, stop pretending like you know. Just learn, take 30 seconds and read about it a little bit. Uh, because the package manager isn't really that complex and, um, okay, Peter's saying it is complex. Not, Right. Okay, uh, I've been corrected. Peter says it, it is, if you get under the covers of the package manager, it's pretty complex. Um, but I've found that um, knowing, knowing generally what it's trying to do for you is 
good to know. Like it's in clarifies. And as Windows users, like we didn't we didn't really have that. Um, so another thing that I'd kind of learned by stumbling around was um, concept of like file permissions and the concept of multiple users on a system. Like I've forgotten that Windows didn't have this multi-user concept by default. Um, and one of the one of the things about coming into Linux is like, like I have a home directory. What's a home directory? And you know, it's like, oh, in Windows you have a home directory, but it's so annoying. It, you can't find the dang thing. Like, where is it? And it's, oh, it's in roaming. No, it's a combination of roaming and this other thing. And where is it at? It's like they don't make it a first-class citizen of their of their operating system. I, I don't think. Uh, but so um, having getting an understanding of that, like, there, this operating system is meant for multiple people by default helped me to finally sort of understand how the thing was constructed. All right, any uh, comments, um, any recommendations maybe I already asked? Any other recommendations? Learn, <clears throat> learn a few things first, what would they be? Yeah, uh, Peter just said it would be interesting to hear what did other people try? Like, what, how did you stumble around? Kind of heard how I stumbled around. Um, but, anybody want to offer up thoughts there? Any concept? Did, did everyone hear Alex okay? Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, Alex was saying that um, his exposure to Linux started with a college class. Um, had an assignment of connecting, a networking assignment of connecting to VirtualBox virtual machines. And it sounds like they were both Linux. And so that was his introduction to Linux. Uh, where did you go from there, Alex? Like, like how, how long ago was that? Right? So Alex, uh, in case anyone couldn't hear, uh, Alex was saying that um, that class introduced him to VirtualBox, uh, and that sort of opened the door for taking that back to his personal hardware, um, and he could avoid a lot of uh, cumbersome details like, do I need to go buy new hardware? No, he didn't need to do that. Um, he could just install VirtualBox, home system, 
um, and then play around with Linux without having to worry about damaging anything um, and roll back and try different things. So uh, that was uh, 2015, I think, is when Alex said he got started that journey. So very interesting. Anybody else uh, pipe up in the chat? So Zoe's comments, everyone could hear that. Zoe. Okay. Okay, so we just had uh, Zoe online um, talk about, um, actually give some very good advice from my experience. If you're going to do hardware and let's say you have a main machine you think you're going to dual boot, um, in my experience, don't do that. Um, I, I think dual boot's a bad um, And Zoe recommended, look, unplug your main drive, plug in a new drive. I also recommend, really want to go that route. If you really want to dual boot, do it physically. Um, the, it seems like, I'm no grub expert, but it seems like these boot managers play with each other's stuff. You boot Windows, and for some reason it wants to mess around with uh, partition, or I don't know. But it's it's the kind of thing where think you're think you're safe until you're not. Then you have to fix something that's very technical. Um, so first comment from Zoe was, "Hey, I I just use different drives." Good advice. Uh, so the next thing Zoe asked was, um, why do we have all this variety? You know, if you go downstream, is it downstream the right term from Ubuntu? Like, you get more variety downstream? Gotcha. Okay, so... So we'll say, if you go downstream, and I mean derived from, so if you start with Ubuntu, why would I use Kubuntu instead of Ubuntu? Why wouldn't I just use Ubuntu? So uh, Kubuntu is a variant of Ubuntu where that team of people has, my understanding, said, we like Ubuntu, but we prefer the KDE desktop over whatever uh, making that stuff with Unity. I don't remember. GNOME. It's back to GNOME. Okay. So, so now, like, but so I'm a KDE person. Like, I have just grown accustomed to the KDE desktop. 
Um, and you know, there are trade-offs for that, but, but I also like the community that comes with Ubuntu. Like, typically, um, I'm accustomed to searching through that community to find solutions. Um, whereas if I, if I switch to Red Hat, I'm going to have to learn a different set of things, a different way of organizing myself and searching the community. Um, so I, I kind of like Ubuntu. It's kind of safe for a person like me, but I have a lot of desktop preferences about the way KDE is structured uh, that work well for my working style. Um, and so I choose Kubuntu. Now some people might say, Steve, you should just use Ubuntu. But my brain is weird, and if I try to use Ubuntu or GNOME, almost any, any variant, GNOME just does not work for me. So a lot of times I think what you get, to answer Zoe's question, is you get uh, family, like Debian family, or Red Hat family, or Arch family, with desktop preferences um, baked in. And a lot of times, you'll see in each tree, you'll see like these variants of, you know, this is the most simple desktop you could possibly have. There will be like three distros who claim to be that. I don't know, elementary OS is probably one of them. Um, so, it, it's, I think it comes down to personal preference. Any, any additional comments, thoughts in that area? So Peter's uh, comment, in case anyone couldn't hear, is pay attention to yourself. Like the value that you're looking for in a, distro, in a distro could really reflect your values. Um, so uh, it, it shouldn't be like, oh, there's this bright new flashy thing coming out and everybody's using it. Look, if that thing doesn't match who you are, in Linux you have the choice. Um, Thanks, Peter. All right, so benefits. Um, how am I doing on time? Comment? Okay, I just don't want to, I don't want to get too far in. All right, so. Uh, I, I got to tell this story. Um, the benefits, somebody mentioned cost on Linux. Um, and, and I converted uh, our company from Windows production system to Linux production. And I did this because I wanted to. And I didn't have like a lot of... Uh, didn't have a lot of, is this being published? All right, so, but anyway, I didn't have a lot of actual like, this is why we should. I have very good technical reasons for doing this. Although if I spent enough time on it, I'm sure I would have. But what was happening is back then, uh, we were shifting to the cloud and our Linux instances, you could get the same CPU and memory footprint in the cloud for half the price of Windows. So if it was a 50 cents per hour Windows instance, I could spin up a uh, 25 cents an hour uh, Linux instance. And so I got this cost savings. And um, I can tell you that as a developer at the time, I didn't care about cost savings. I don't care about linear cost savings. So if I can get a, if I can get a 30 percent reduction in cost, I'm not like automatically attracted for my own purposes. Um, I know the business wants that, but for me, I'm interested when it's like 10x reduction in cost or 10x improvement in value. And um, so one of the few times in my life where I've been sort of a salesperson, I sold the, uh, I sold the, the, the cost reduction, F, um, what is that, a, 
times reduction, something like that. So I sold that to the org in order to push Linux because I knew it was right. And in retrospect, that was the, the correct thing for us to do because um, there's, there's all these benefits of being Linux-based in the cloud and what that opens up for you as an organization. And also, um, certainly, like the people that I hired, it was easier for me to say to them, look, I need you to work in a legacy stack for a little bit, um, but you're also going to learn Linux. So it was like this balance I could present. Um, a, lot of, a lot of good benefits of converting the company. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to blow through these pretty quick. Um, abstractly, being able to control your tool set matters if you're, if you're a developer. Pay attention to this. Um, I mentioned before that I've always owned my own hardware. It's like owning your own set of tools as a mechanic. You own your own hammers. It changes your mind. It changes your brain. And when you own your own hardware, but it has to be Microsoft Windows or it has to be Mac, that's a different thing to your brain. Owning the hardware and also controlling what's on the hardware. So I'm, just, I'm not going to get too squishy with it, but I believe that you become a different type of individual. Um, another thing is you have a broader set of tools that you can play with. I'm going to tell another story. Uh, but they're free. They're typically free. Now, they don't, they're not always free, but um, a lot of times the things coming out of the universities and the research places are, are free to try. Like, and, and you can, most of it's open source. So why does that matter? Um, I'll tell you. So in Windows, I'm in love with this program called Araxis Merge. And my brain likes the color and the way that the differences are displayed. So the Araxis Merge is a differencing program. And as a developer, you put this code on the left and this code on the right. And then um, you see the differences. So if, you know, there could be a 1,000 lines, but you see the three that are different. And your brain triggers right in on that. <clears throat> the, the, um, in Linux, you can't find that exact thing. Um, but you know, so I've tried. I've tried a, a lot of different options. Um, recently, I said I think I need to use that particular merge program again for a very specific thing, and I almost went out and bought it. But it's going to probably take 30 minutes to an hour to complete the IT requisition for that tool. I just couldn't do it. I said, I don't, I'm not going to do it. I, I don't feel like spending an hour of my life trying to get permission and funding for a thing. Um, and so like, you can see that having tools that you can try that, that are accessible, um, your speed of adopting new tools changes. It changes who you are. Uh, and then also the same concept around the pace of learning. A lot of new stuff that's coming out is typically going to be Linux first. Now, uh, this was very, very true in 09. Like, I wanted to learn Python. And guess what? There was something special you had to do. You got a special version of Python for Windows back in 09. Um, and, or it might have been 10, 11. But special, you had to go through special hoops. And then you weren't even sure, am I getting the same thing that this guy is talking about? Everything was Linux first back then. And so, like, uh, the benefit of switching to Linux primarily then was I was learning industry standard stuff faster or leading edge industry stuff faster than if I stayed in Windows. Um, and then I think you open yourself up to a better, or not better, but broader um, The open source community, is, I'm just learning. Huge. Um, very, like, you'll find brilliant people. You, know, you can look through different projects, uh, join open source communities, and find um, find influences that don't exist. Narrowed in type. Uh, <laughs> all right, I'm not going to add a subheading, so you can ignore that. <clears throat> um, but I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, the so actually, preparing for the talk uh, was a struggle. 
because like I said early on, was um, trying to figure out why. And then I, I had to reflect on how has Linux been good to me? How is this, why, is, why would I do this talk? Usually I'm, I'm after some corporate goal or trying to, what's my key performance metric or whatever. Um, just, you know, it occurred to me that Linux improves the autonomy of you as an individual. Um, which I think, in general, is good. I think Linux is good for humanity, and so that end, I didn't really need much more. Uh, I'll wrap it up. If we want to have any thoughts, the uh, floor is open. Um, I agree with Zoe. Um, at the risk of making a really nerdy comment, um, when you really grasp uh, Linux and the concept of open source, it's a bit like Can the online people hear that, or should I summarize? You might want to summarize it. Um, so I won't remember everything that Alex said, but um, he said that the, um, like, once you discover the open source community and, and what's possible, um, it's a whole different thing. Or, like, uh, getting plugged into the matrix. Um, and then, so, briefly about how much innovation flows from the community uh, because there's so many people with ideas uh, plugged into this thing and they see what's possible and, and, and you get this rapid uh, innovation. And I can I think my feeling is most of the really good innovation, deep innovation, does seem to So, thank you, Alex. The possibility of some speculation that Linux will be the last actual operating system. That's my summary point. 
take time to break one of the maintenance or something that might get done to break one of the maintenance structures in the spot. First, there's a bouncing and a modifying the game approach. I've heard that as well from people who seem to be in the OS field, kernel field. They feel like Uh, they feel like there has been like there's so much effort into doing it that there's no reason they rewrite everything. I personally good comment. But there's other companies that are just consuming open source. And, you know, there will be eventually a problem if people don't contribute back. Right? Open source was successful because a few innovative people, when they came up with a really cool idea, they shared it. Right? And when you get into the into the culture of mass sharing, then it it will end up like any other open source movie. Several different things that all these forks will have. It'll be a mess, actually. So that's one of the things that's really cool about Linux and the open source community is it's based on the concept of sharing. You know, when I first started working at Red Hat, we would give out stickers and stations and stuff that said, "Your mother was right. This study was sharing." Um, and I think that's really true. You know, and everybody, everyone understands that to the same level. That's what we're doing. I've been thinking about, uh, of course, recently, sort of along the lines of who owns it, like the people, no corporation that um, contributes, um, which means something. And this is only patents their idea. Um, so if Red Hat does something like that, the individual developers of Red Hat will fall behind. But they leave Red Hat patent over. Right? But the, they, they, they created the idea, they get the patent on it. So IBM bought a company that's no intellectual property. So I've always heard about that, like kind of <clears throat> someone who doesn't really understand open source concept fully, I was, well, how can Red Hat even exist? And then how can they sell an enterprise? Um, but, you know, over time, I, I sort of get it more. But for me to talk about uh, what it means, I think Peter was correcting me, that the, the original, uh, the original um, engineer or coder actually retains ownership. So my, me saying that the uh, community or the people own it is not quite right. Um, that you as the developers retain ownership but grant a certain level of sharing. What, what, uh, what is the, like I don't want to get into the licensing stuff, but what, how, is it the GNU license? Like which one is the primary thing? Linux? Final, and I think it's LTPL2, if I'm not uh, incorrect. Yeah, LTPL2. Uh, so 
to avoid Linux is the kernel, and that's it. So if you talk about what's the primary on Linux, there's only one thing to look at, right? Yep. But there's like billions of our projects, and probably more than a handful or two of different licenses that are very common, and they're not always compatible. So that's one of the trigger leads that you have when you try to, uh, let's say, sell something that has open source in it, because there are different, if you take things from different projects, there are different conditions on what are you allowed to do. Uh, in some places, you have to show your own source code. In other cases, you only have to show the source code you, you started from. Uh, in other cases, again, you may not even use it in a commercial. Uh, there have been lots of changes in some companies trying to battle what they call it, what they think of as abuse when other companies take what they produce and sell it for cheaper than they do. Anyway, so they've tried to make it impossible and or illegal for you to use it in our commercial system. But it, it's all in this open source license. GPL or APL, the Apache license, are probably the most commonly found out there. And taking a little bit of time to, uh, to read them and see what it is, what actually happened, will not only teach you about the history of open source and all the way from RMS, all the way to where we are today, uh, from, and understand what it is we mean when we say open source, or the word free. Because the word free in English has a very odd sound when you talk about open source, because it's not about money. It never has been about money. It's about freedom. It's the freedom of me as a contributor to use someone else's work and have the right to use someone else's work to stand on their shoulders so I could become better at what I do. And the only thing that is sort of the, the backside of that is I can't do that without also giving other right, other people right to my work to do the same. That's pretty much all I give away. But it's still my work. Yeah, and the other aspect yeah. of the of open source is giving you the benefit. That's one of the big benefits too. So open source doesn't really lock you into somebody and how they think you should search a bank or how they think you should write code or how they think you should um, perform database functions or any of that, right? Perform search on that way. Um, we give you a lot of options. And that's one of the biggest benefits of an open source system. You have options. And sometimes people don't realize that. We see it every once in a while from um, from 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 customers at work, right? They'll be like, "Oh, well, you know, Red Hat has this, and the rest of the open source community is heading that way." And then six months later, Red Hat will have the logo of the open source community on the shoes, and we'll have our old logo with all the right font. Um, but we can look and say, "Oh, it's one of my shoes. That's not a good choice, right?" Or maybe our way of server default that eventually we get the Wix and Google logo default. Um, it's kind of cool. Like there's, there's two different security um, mechanisms in Linux. They both use the same security module. One's called Appen and the other one's called Azure Linux. We're going to be talking about Azure Linux in July. I'm going to have our guest speaker come in to talk about Azure Linux. Um, they both perform, perform the same function. So uh, in case anyone couldn't hear Peter, but but Peter, before uh, Ted started talking, <clears throat> talked a little bit about the different varieties of, of um, licensing. But the thing that I remember Peter saying, read a little bit about the history. You'll, you'll That it's worth.
is to uh, help them with documentation. For some reason, I just don't like all these documentation. Well, there can be tons of the <laughs> infrastructure <laughs> things. There are graphical design yeah. logos, I translation. There's tons of things to put on there, right? Yeah. Alex was <coughs> telling, relaying that, remember that people are contributing on their own free. Very well, but. So, uh, anything else or call it a wrap? Thanks, everyone. Thank